Are we good back there, Brother Smith? All right, two thumbs up. Pastor Matt only gives me one, so two is better than one. But at any rate, so glad you're here this afternoon, and I uh, hope you had a great Sunday afternoon, day, and it's been hot. Uh, and I was thinking about it this week uh, as we were moving up towards the, the weekend. I saw the hot temperatures, and I thought, in Newfoundland, we never got this hot. This, this was unhealthy hot. Uh, and uh, we, I can't remember ever, I th once or twice 30, a summer, maybe, if it was a really good summer, and like there's hardly any humidity, and if it was that hot, there was lots of wind, and uh, you know, we never had AC, never, in our house, and uh, I remember my dad bought the first car he bought with AC in it. It was a Buick, I mean, it was a dandy. And it that had AC. And I remember as a kid, we came up here around this time of the year. I had lots of family lived in Mississauga in Pickering. We'd come up for vacation. And I remember going from Pickering to the African Lion Safari. Is that in Cambridge area, right? And we drove across the top of Toronto in this kind of heat with no AC on. Because we had no AC. And we had all the windows cranked down as low as it could go. We were like the poor dog with the tongue hanging out. It was so hot. And then I just thought about that this weekend. This has been so humid. And uh, you Ontario kids are used to it, but this, this Newfie is not. Uh, I'm living in the basement. It's cool. But at any rate, uh, praise the Lord, it's sunny. And uh, we thank the Lord for his goodness to us. So um, I'm going to try to sing a song for you, and you can join in if you know it. And uh, we started last week with the chorus, Redeeming the Time, so this week uh, we'll uh, do the, the, the one of the lines in it, so one line, like what, the first, first verse, yes, and uh, we'll sing the chorus through twice. Time now is short and Christ's return draws nearer every day. The world and the wicked lust thereof doth quickly pass away. Let us be walking circumspectly, not as fools but wise. Fixing our thoughts on the Lord's appearing, looking to the skies. Redeeming the time, for the days are evil. Trusting his word, let us watch and pray. Rejoicing in hope, for he cometh quickly. Haste to prepare his way. Redeeming the time. So let's do the chorus one more time. Redeeming the time, for the days are evil. Trusting his word, let us watch and pray. Rejoicing in hope, for he cometh quickly. Haste to prepare his way. Redeeming the time. All right, so last week we looked at our theme verse for this year, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 7, redeeming the time because the days are evil. But there's another verse in the Bible that talks about redeeming the time, and that's in Colossians chapter 4 and verse number 5. So that's another good verse for you to memorize. So I'm just going to read it for you uh, a few times here. So Colossians chapter 4, verse 5, it says, Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. So guys, Colossians 4, 5, walking in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. So let's make sure we're redeeming the time, taking the opportunities to use each moment we have. All right, take your Bibles and turn over to Revelation chapter number 11. Revelation chapter number 11. Revelation chapter number 11, and we're going to start down in verse number 15. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 11 and verse number 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord 
and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell down upon their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and thou shalt give reward unto thy servants, thy prophets, and to thy saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was a scene in and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquake and great hail. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for another opportunity we have to look into your word now as we continue our series in Revelation. Lord, help us to know the truth and Lord, to live by it. And Lord, thank you for this time now in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, we've been a while now going through the book of Revelation uh, and... Uh, I don't know about you, but I certainly have enjoyed the study, putting the lessons together, and um, certainly have heard a lot of the feedback from folks in person and online uh, that they've enjoyed it as well. So this message brings us to the halfway point of the book of Revelation. Not halfway point of the tribulation, but of the book of Revelation. And it brings us to the end of the section that began back in Revelation chapter 10, the first verse. Uh, and the seventh trump was sound, that was announced in Ch uh, Revelation 10, 7. And it sounded the trump will unleash God's final acts of judgment upon the earth. And the seventh trumpet will bring with it a devastating wave of judgment. And it will fulfill the ancient prophecies in Joel chapter 2. I'm going to read that for you. Joel chapter 2, verse number 1. Blow ye the trump in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, as morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. There have never been ever, sorry, have not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after, even to the years of many generations. When it sounds, that trumpet, that seven bold judgments are revealed, and they're going to be... Um, I, I hate to use the word awesome because we think of awesome like it's really good. It's awesome in its wrath and its, and its great destruction and the judgments that are going to come. And that, we'll get to that in Revelation chapter 15. The sound of the seventh trumpet alerts the world that Jesus Christ is about to reclaim everything that belongs to him. The Lord's going to return. So it says there, so the seventh angel sounded. Now, there's some individuals who preach and teach, and let's face it, all preaching and teaching in the last year and a half have been online uh, for the most part, and they teach uh, and endeavor to connect that verse in Revelation to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, where it says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. So we would know that that verse refers to the rapture, and what they're trying to do is tied that verse in 1 Corinthians 15 to what's going on in Revelation. And they've come to the conclusion of a mid-trib rapture. So they're, they, they've come up with this, and I, I want to refute it because it's very popular. Okay, uh, Not that I think it's a really good thing to be popular, uh, but has become something that a lot of Christians have taken on. And I don't see that in Scripture that God wants any, uh, the church to go through the rapture, or sorry, through the tribulation, to be raptured, then the tribulation takes place, because tribulation is dealing with wicked men, and then with Israel, and we're getting right into the Israel part now, and going forward. Uh, so, uh, this, there's no, there is absolutely no contextual co connection between what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, and what John says in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. There's no connection point. They made this connection. And trumps, trumpets were a common form of signaling in that first century. Uh, it was used to tell when there was warriors attacking. <clears throat> Has anyone ever seen a, a tattoo, not a tattoo that you put in your arm or something, 
but a tattoo where they use the drums and the whistles and things like that. Has anyone ever seen that? Nobody? Oh, you miss a big part of British. Okay, that's right. I made my wife go to it. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, so what they would do, the British uh, Empire, when they had their armies fighting stuff, they would have, you know, the drummer and things. And the drummer was to announce what the formation should be because it was loud over the musket fire and things. Boom, boom, boom. So the drum was used as an instrument to signal. So was the trumpets. The trumpets were used. Uh, to say, hey, uh, this is what you need to do. And they, they were used for all kinds of different signals. Uh, so it was the last trump in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52, is the signal that the church age is done. When the rapture takes place, the church is raptured out of here, the church age is done. It has an age. It has a, a beginning point. It acts. And sometime in the future, we think it's near future, that the Lord is going to call the church home, then the church age will be done. All right? People still going to get saved after that. We've already seen that. But there is a, a time limit on it. And so there's no connection with that trump in 1 Corinthians and this trumpet in Revelation. And they're actually two, totally two different things. One is to remove from judgment. The other one is to declare judgment. They're two different things. And another thing that if you try to make this connection, then your uh, timetable is way off because this is past, uh, this is for the people who are trying to promote this mid-trib position, this is actually past the midpoint of the tribulation period. If you're using this as that point, we're past that. The tribulation is getting pretty close to being done in the book of Revelation, so you're, you're really a late end of tribulation uh, rapture type thing. Uh, so I just want to make those points because they're out there. Good chance if you read any books about Revelation or Tribulation, there's a good chance those things will be seen in there. Again, it's in the last <clears throat> 15 years, it has become so popular, and I don't understand it. Uh, I, I never met anyone 20 years ago who had that position. I've met lots who have it now, and I don't understand it, why it removes Israel out of its rightful place the church is out of There's all kinds of problems with it, but I just want to make mention about that because this is a verse and the other one is a verse they use for it. So verses 16 and 17, there's rejoicing over the ruler. Uh, and the four and twenty elders which sat before God uh, on their seats, they fell upon their faces and they worshiped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast given to thee thy great power and hast reigned. Uh, heaven rejoices because God... Uh, and his son, Jesus Christ, to take possession of this world. Uh, and, and, you know, this, it's theirs. Kingdoms of this world. In the Greek, the word kingdoms is singular, so it's just one. There's many rulers today, leaders, kings, presidents, but there's only one true kingdom. Men think they rule. In reality, it's God, uh, Satan is trying to rule this world, God of this world. In 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the Lord Jesus Christ called him the prince of this world three times in John's Gospel, John 12, 31, 14, 30, and 16, 11. Uh, the truth of Satan's rule can be seen in his hatred to that what, to anything to do with Jesus Christ. I, I don't know if you've seen this, but if you say you believe in a God, most people won't have a problem with that. They're like, oh yeah, I believe there's a God too. Uh, but a lot of people get really uh, tense and upset if you say, I believe in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ gets people's attention, and they don't like it. And uh, the idea is that, you know, people hate Jesus, uh, and, and they are against him, and it, that's uh, energized by, the, you know, the one who rules right now, but that's going to be short-lived because the Lord is the king, amen? He's the ruler of all. He's allowing this. Jesus Christ will come in glory and power and assume his rightful place, here as king, as lord of this earth, and one day, every knee will bow. Every knee will come to a throne room with Jesus Christ on that throne, and they will bow the knee and say, you are king. No one's going to escape that. And they might say, no, I'll never do it. Well, too bad, you're going to do it. Uh, the, you know, I don't want to say that in a mean way, but the Lord, Jesus Christ, is Lord. And we see the span of his kingdom, he shall reign forever and ever. Jesus is not like any human ruler. 
uh, all human rulers, eventually their reigns will end. So I don't know how long it goes now, but I just was thinking about this week, I was putting this message together. You know, North Africa and places like that, for a long time, the same tyrant, dictator was ruling. And then it was in the, was it called the Arab Spring or something? And all these long time dictators all fell and, you know, we just thought they would continue ruling forever, right? We just thought they're there, they're, nothing's ever going to happen to them. The reality is all men die, all men are replaceable. They die or disposed and replaced by another, but not Jesus. Jesus never will be. He'll reign for eternity. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and thy dominion endure throughout all generations. That's in Psalms 145, verse 13. Now, I don't know how much news you're watching. I probably would tell you to make sure you don't stick yourself glued to the news because you'd probably be depressed and probably need biblical counseling and other things of that nature. But, uh, you know, on the news stations and radios and things and Internet, they're talking about the possibility of a fall election. That's what the, the big talk is, you know fall election. And the liberals are going to try very, very hard to regain the majority in the parliament, and the conservatives are going to try very, very hard to take away the reins of power in parliament. There will be winners, and there will be losers, right? There's no one, it, it's not like a participation award when we were, people are in school these days. Oh, you participated, here's a pin. You know, someone's going to win and someone's going to lose, all right? And that's what's going to happen. And those uh, who give their allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ never have to be afraid of being losers. We're not going to lose. We're on the winning side. All right, we make that decision for Christ. He is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We're on, we're on the winning side. Uh, and then verse 17 talks about the strength, almighty, that thou hast uh, thy great power and thou hast reigned. Every human kingdom fails because uh, it's built on the limit limit the power of men. I mean, we think about Rome. I mean, that was probably the greatest empire in the sense of size and time. It was massive, but it was limited. It, it, it'll, it'll fall in, it fell, it fell in itself. And the future uh, world government, it'll fall in itself. Any kind of kingdom will fall eventually. Is limited by the power of men. Uh, you know, Saddam Hussein, he lived on the power of fear for ages. He got found in a spider hole you know, and he was hung. Uh, Kim Jong-un in North Korea, as Mr. Trump calls him, Rocket Man. I like that one myself. Uh, Rocket Man, I mean, he, he rules with intimidation. He's an angry man. He's ruthless. But he will be defeated. He'll fall. And I'm not saying in combat or anything, but he, he, no one lives forever. No one lasts. No one reigns forever. God's kingdom is established and he's the one who holds all power. And he will never be overcome by any enemy. No enemy is even going to be able to come close. You know, we're going to look in the days ahead, Lord willing, about when the Lord returns from heaven, the Battle of Armageddon, the armies of men gather together in the Valley of Megiddo, and, you know, Jesus speaks, and it's done. I mean... Uh, he speaks, and he, there's destruction. Like, the Lord's never going to swing a sword. Like, he's not going to put his feet on the ground of earth and start slaying men with a sword. He'll speak, and they will be defeated. So the enemies of God, of Jesus Christ, they don't have a chance. There's, there's no chance. He'll place all those foes under his feet. And Hebrews 2 and 8 talks about that. And... Uh, he will never be disposed by rivals, uh, for he doesn't have any rivals. Uh, Psalm 86.10, For thou art great, and dost wondrous things, thou art God alone. So it only makes sense, only another God could be a rival, but God is the only God. It's him. Uh, stability of his kingdom, which art and wast and art to come. <clears throat> God's kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Uh, he, he always has reign. It may look, as we look in our world today, we see some really bad things and we say, well, you know, Satan is in control of everything and I understand he's reigning, you know, he's causing chaos here. It may look like he's in total control. But you know that Satan is accountable to God? You know, God is still letting him operate, but within his limited sphere, he has limits on him. 
He does only what God allows him to do. His activity is limited by the providence, sovereignty, and power purposes of God. Uh, we can find that in Job, right? Job was uh, attacked by Satan, but Satan went before God in the courts of heaven and said, let me go at your servant Job, and I'll show him how bad a guy he is. God said, okay, but you can't take his life. And Satan could never, couldn't take his life. He wasn't allowed. He, that was it. So Satan is uh, thought, he's not infinite. He's finite. He's limited. He is, he's a created creature. All right? And he's going to have to yield to the one who reigns for eternity. And in heaven rejoices in this truth that he reigns. <clears throat> and if you believe it, you should rejoice as well. He's in control. And uh, we know who he is. Uh, we, without a doubt, he's God. He reigns, and he has absolute control. First Colossians, or sorry, Colossians chapter one, verse sixteen: For by him were all things created that are in heaven, the things in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Uh, so there's a bit of a running joke in my house. Sunday afternoons, uh, after we eat lunch, I watch a program called Mighty Trains, and I have watched every episode probably four or five times. Uh, I just love trains, all right? And I watch them go through Switzerland, across Australia, and all over the place, uh, and different things. I find it really cool. I love the scenery, and it's pretty cool watching trains and things. You know, I cannot afford to stay in the rooms they have on those trains, but it's really nice. And then the, after this episode today, I was watching... Uh, I watched an episode of Aerial Views of Countries. And today's one, I, it's the first time I ever watched that I'm aware of this program. It was about New Zealand. New Zealand is an amazing looking place, especially from the sky. Looking down, that's, that's all, all the idea. It's aerial. They don't go in any buildings. It's just you're flying over everything. Super neat. And I, I watched that. I was like, oh man, I hope I get to go there sometime. That would be amazing. But I just amazed at God's creation. It's beautiful. It's stunning from you know the lush uh, pasture lands where all the sheep and cows and things to huge mountains. There's a mountain there called Mountain Mount Cook, and they actually train use that mountain as training to go to Mount Everest. So the massive and snow covered. You don't really think about snow-covered mountains in the South Pacific, but it was amazing. And God created that. And, and uh, one of the people who lived, I can't remember this guy's name, they mentioned it in this program today, that one of the guys from uh, New Zealand discovered the atom. None of us, if you have an atom, don't break it, right? It's, it's a nuclear explosion if you break an atom. It's invisible. And that's our God created all those things. That's how powerful our God is. And that's how stable is. He made it all, and it doesn't go flying around in the night. It stays secure. It's amazing. Uh, we are, in a little bit further there, are become. Uh, we are, are become. Uh, where is that verse here now? Um, which are, oh, yeah, sorry, that's the same part. Uh, art, uh, art, which art and was and art to come. Uh, so, you know, the idea is it's going to happen. It's being spoken of that it is happening. It will happen. It kind of relays back to Isaiah 53, verses 3 to 9, where Isaiah talks about the suffering Jesus Christ that was 700 years before Christ would uh, go through that suffering, but he wrote as if it already happened. It's going to happen. This is happening. People can believe what they will, but one day the kingdoms of this world will say, Jesus Christ is king. He is the king of this world, of this universe. He will rule, he will reign on the throne of this earth. No wonder heaven rejoices. I thank God for that reality. And it should be thankful, make you thankful and, and bring some joy to your heart and recognize that, hey, our king is in control. Now there's a plan being worked out. There's been lots of really scary things and death and destruction already relayed, and there's going to be more, but it's all working out according to his plan and the results of sin and things, but God has a plan. He's putting it all together. And in verse 18, um, we see that sinners will be rewarded, and it doesn't sound like they're really more, more judgment than rewarded, but uh, the world hates Jesus, the nations were angry, and thy wrath has, gone, has come, and the time of the dead, and they 
that they should be judged. <clears throat> and he's going to come and reign, and he's going to judge them. And we're going to look ahead in, Re in Revelation chapter 16, where they gather against Christ to fight against him. Uh, you don't have to look very hard in our world today to see that our world, our society, desires to remove anything about Jesus Christ. Any chance they can. Let's remove it. We don't, I mean, I understand some countries are more against it than others, but they try to eradicate the name of Jesus in the public arena. Uh, they, will, they don't want to bow to him. No, we don't. Their, their hatred is expressed. Uh, you got your Bibles. Look over in Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter number 2. <clears throat> Psalm chapter number 2 and verse number 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. You know, that, that's, how, that's hatred. When you plan the destruction of another, um, that's hatred. That's driven by hatred. Uh, and then go on, verse number four, we see God has the final say, and he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision, confusion. Have, uh, I can remember growing up and my grandfather, uh, you know, he's in his 90s now, but you know, when I was just a 10-year-old kid, so he's about, what, 60s, uh, he, I would try to take him down and he'd laugh. He'd like, oh, go away, Mark, and you know, push me aside and, uh, I try to grab him, whatever, and he squeezed my knee, and I go in a lump of, <laughs> let go of me, you know, type of thing. You know, that's the idea. It's like, you guys, the Lord looks, what are you guys getting? You can't defeat me. I'm God. He laughs at them in derision. Then he shall speak unto them, and with his wrath infects them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the, uh, thy decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. As of me, I will give thee the heathen for an inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. There's none of them going to be able to come close to the Lord. He, no way. You're, you're done. Lost sinners will be rewarded for their rejection of Jesus Christ and they'll face them in in the judgment, and again, we'll see that in Revelation chapter 20. And God will have the final word, <clears throat> and lost sinners will receive their payment, will receive their due. And what a tragedy, since they could be saved. They could be saved. Saints will be rewarded in this passionate portion of Scripture as well. And uh, they run to thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and then the, that fear thy name, small and great, thou shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. So while lost sinners will face judgment, the faithful ones will be honored for the devotion. We will read of his servants, prophets, those who faithfully preach the word will be rewarded by the Lord one day. And he will reward all his servants, them that fear thy name, great and small. You know, one day, every act of devotion for the Lord will be rewarded by him. And nothing goes unnoticed. And I've, I've been in ministry long enough that I've had people say, well, nobody notices what I do. And, you know, I'm, we don't do it, we shouldn't do it. If your motive is to be seen, you're doing it for the wrong motive. Uh, but I can appreciate to some extent, you know, people want to be appreciated. Who doesn't want to be appreciated? You know, uh, you like to hear, hey, good job. And I like to hear, well, that was encouraging message, pastor, or whatever. We all appreciate that appreciation. I understand that. And it's not a bad thing. But the reality is there's lots of things we do in life that no one knows about. It's only the Lord, and he doesn't miss any of it. He doesn't miss any of it. It was funny this morning, I got home, my wife's like, you forgot the list of all the graduates, didn't you? Because you wouldn't say their names on the, this morning. I was like, uh, no, I do have them written down, honey, but I'm pretty sure I forgot somebody. So I'd rather not say anybody's name, and then everybody remains nameless, except the graduates who know that they're graduates, they come get their Bibles, you know, type of thing. Uh, but the reality is, nothing is missed by the Lord. He, even that cold cup of water, talked about in Mark chapter 9, verse 41. There is a reward for that. Every uh, labor of love, every gift, every deed, the encouraging word. Obviously, uh, Paul or 
John didn't know anything about texting at that time, but every promising, encouraging text, message, that's all important. It's all part of life. And it, the Lord knows it. It doesn't go unnoticed. Every sacrifice, spoke about sacrifice this morning in the message, nothing escapes the Lord's eye. He knows. He sees. And that should be encouraging that the Lord knows. And I don't do it for a reward. And I hope you don't do it, but it's nice to know that the Lord knows He's watching over us, and it should be a motivation because we love Him to serve Him. In verse number 19, uh, there's a, a rejoicing as well. And the temple of God was open in heaven, and there was seen in His temple the ark of His testament. And then there was lightnings, voices, thunderings, and an earthquake and great hail. <clears throat> so this verse really is like a transitional verse in the sense it uh, brings, our, brings us to Jewish ground, if we want to use that terminology, uh, the nations are mentioned in things, but now the focus changes to Israel and to Jewish people. And we see here, there's no ark for the church, right? There's no ark of the covenant, okay? That's never been in the realm of the Gentiles. This is a Jewish thing, okay? And the idea that there was access and was open in heaven, there was seen in this temple the ark of his testament. That open temple, the vision of the ark, and in, the, in, in heaven, is access to the Lord. We'll, we'll see Him, we'll be able to worship Him, and there'll be no veil to separate Him from us. And that's how the Jewish people would have known it, who were reading this scripture. That's how they would know the temple. Uh, there, was, there was nothing separating. There'll be nothing to keep us away. We have free, unfettered uh, access to God, which really was strange to a Jewish, someone who was brought up in Judaism, because they always saw that uh, veil in between. And, and the mention of the ark places, again, like I said, right in the Jewish ground. Uh, the ark of the covenant represented the presence of God. A Jewish person reading this would know it. That's what it meant. Uh, communion with God, the redemption of God. And the Jews are reminded that God's not finished with them. Okay, He will complete His plan for Israel. He will keep his covenants uh, with the seed of Abraham. And uh, there's only one Ark of the Covenant, but there's a number of names through Scripture that refers to the same thing, and I just want to mention them real quick. The Ark of the Covenant, Numbers chapter 10, verse 33, it contained the law that was received on, uh, in the Mount Sinai. And uh, these, in these verses in, in Numbers 10, 33, see a world that's transgressed God's law, and the, Lord, the world was ang angered the Lord, and he's going to judge them. And that's what he's doing in these verses as well. He's judging them. Uh, it's an ark of testimony, Exodus 25, 22. And there I'll meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubs, uh, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all the things which I give thee in the commandment unto the children of Israel. The ark testified to God's holiness and to man's sinfulness. God's still holy, and man's still a sinner. As a sinner, man will be judged by a holy God. So that's the testimony part. Ark of God, 1 Samuel 3, 3. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. The ark was the only visible throne of God on earth. And this throne of the ark reminds us that God is still on the throne. And, and that uh, scripture talks about where the ark of covenant was stolen by the Philistines in battle. And they actually put it in front of their gods and all their gods fell down and their arms and heads all broke off their idols and things just to say, you know, I'm the only God. I'm it. And they will all bow to my throne. Uh, Ark of Strength, uh, Psalms 132, verse 8. Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, thou and the ark of thy strength. Um, so it was called this because of the miracles and great works associated with it. We're reminded here that God is still almighty God. He still reigns. He's still all-powerful. And in the last the time, it's referred to as the Holy Ark. In 2 Chronicles 35, verse 3, it's called the Holy Ark because that's where God dwelt. So it has to be holy. This is where God dwells. It has to be holy. Uh, and in the latter part of verse 19, uh, we, we get the, um, the visual lightning, voices, thunderings, earthquakes, and hail. There's some impending disasters about to unfold on earth, okay? More horrors uh, on the horizon. And like I said, now we're past the halfway point 
of the book of Revelation. And uh, so I hope that's helped you understand this chapter a little bit better. And just to understand that, hey, let's be encouraging those who don't know Christ as Savior to come to Him. And as a Christian, I don't fear what's recorded in Revelation. I've met some Christians like, oh, I'm afraid of getting in this book, Pastor, and things. You don't need to be afraid of it. If you know Christ as Savior, you're not going to be affected by these judgments and vials and trumpets and things. <clears throat> you're in heaven with the Lord. And as we go a little bit further... Uh, and we've already looked in places before, uh, way back, that we are in heavenly places with the Lord. We are what's taking place. We will see ourselves as Christians. So uh, make sure you're using it to encourage your heart that the Lord is in control and, uh, and serve others the best that you can. All right, so uh, any questions? Any questions about that? You got Revelation chapter 11, verses 15 and 19, all wrapped up. Ready to go. All right. I don't see anybody. So if you do, you can ask me after as well. Uh, just upcoming this week, uh, no podcast on Tuesday. Uh, we'll be back the following week uh, with podcast. Our final Zoom Bible study for the summer is on se- uh, Wednesday at 7. And then Thursday is Canada Day. Uh, it looks like it's going to be a total wash from what the weatherman's saying. But I will give you, I will have a little Facebook devotion on Thursday. I'm not going to say when because I don't know exactly when yet, but it'll be there sometime during the day. Check it out. You get a chance, just go have a look. Uh, Saturday, there is none, no Facebook devotion. And then next Sunday, uh, we're stepping in that stage two. I guess that's Wednesday we step into that. I think it is. But next Sunday, we can have 25%, which is over 60 people. So come on out Sunday morning, Sunday night. We had a really good crowd here this morning. We're close to full. Uh, So come on out. Want to see you. It's encouraging to see folks. And have a great week. Keep encouraging others and keep looking to Jesus and redeem the time. Thank you for being here.